Welcome everybody. This is Christina Nomdu and I'm the Western Cape Commissioner for Children. And I'm really happy to be with you today. Hello. Uh, I'm the Western Cape Commissioner for Children and I'm really happy to be with you today. My name is Christina Nomdu. Um, this is my first ever Facebook Live event, so I'm quite unnerved by this technology. But my strategy is that I'm going to just survive by relaxing, which is what I normally do with uh, when I'm in children's training sessions. The best thing is just to be authentic and to be relaxed and to be myself. And that's the way we can have productive conversations with each other. So I think also I'm a bit more relaxed because we're talking about my favorite topic, which is child participation rights. And I think people are very familiar with uh, child protection rights. Uh, children should be protected from harm. And children are also entitled to provisioning rights. So we provide it with education, nutrition, for example. But not very many of us talk about child participation rights. Uh, it's a sticky issue. And uh, we're going to be having some challenging conversations through this um, through this format. So I hope you'll stick with me for the next 30 minutes. Um, it's also a fitting topic, child participation rights in Youth Month, which is the month that commemorates our struggle heroes and especially children who became activists at a very young age. I remember Sadiso Matona from the National Planning Commission. He's now the Secretary of Planning um, I met him when I was a commissioner on the National Planning Commission. He was telling us at a children's workshop in Pumalanga how he started his activism at 14 years old and his mother was very fearful of um, all the activities he was engaged in. He was very um, active, he was putting himself on the line, he was putting his life at risk, which many of our children and youth were doing at that time in our history. And it's always a pity for me that, that those adults now don't share with the children of today that uh, their history of activism when they were themselves children. A uh, special shout out goes to my niece Tia Kion, who is uh, the only child and youth in my family at the moment. You will know that my mandate ends at 18 years old when everybody becomes adults. So Tia is the only one that fits in that 14 to 18 uh, age range. She's a wonderfully resilient young lady and I'm, I have so much admiration for her. Uh, also, I would like to be able to tell you what I do as Children's Commissioner. So what I've done is I have actually asked a young lady, Isabella, who's eight years old, to read a story that I wrote to explain um, what I do as the Children's Commissioner. So I hope you are able to follow the story and to be able to then say, see exactly what the Children's Commissioner's role is in the Western Cape. So let me find that story for you and play. There is a special person in our province that must protect children's rights. She is called the Children's Commissioner. She has been given superpowers to do her job and to protect children. Her first superpower is search and find problems in government that stops them from improving children's lives. She looks at school, clinics, sports and projects to help children be safe. A second superpower is to gather facts that help us understand children better. She wants to know what children are worried about. A third superpower is to tell everyone how wonderful children are and that they must be valued. She asks adults to listen to children's views and opinions. The Children's Commissioner is there to listen to children when nobody else wants to. 
Thank you, Isabella, who is eight years old. And this is what child participation, in a way, means. It means for me that children must be involved in every aspect of our lives. And especially, uh, they must be involved in every decision that affects their life. They have that right. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, we're going to talk about what are child participation rights? What is child participation in governance, which is something that I will introduce through my office? And who are the child government monitors? So those are the three areas we will talk more about um, during this 30 minutes of being live with you. So I'm not going to actually give you a whole litany of laws and rights instruments and um, all those things that prove that children have participation rights. Rather, I'm going to challenge you to be able to meet me in the hearts and minds space. You, you need to reflect on how you feel about this and how you think about this personally, this area of child participation. We, we call these kind of constructive discussions where we may differ, in fact, in our views as communications for social change. So we're wanting to create a better society for children. And the way to do that is to help each other understand more about children and their rights. So those are the three areas I will cover. And the first um, question that everybody always asks me, but when should children participate? What should they participate in? And um, does the participation actually mean anything? Do they understand what they're doing when they participating in all these things? Well, I think that for me, the first uh, issue that I would like to bring to you is that age is the main reason for undermining children in society. We use their age against them. We, we make assumptions about what they can and cannot do at a particular age. Uh, and I'm telling you that you would be surprised about the kind of participation rights, we call them autonomy rights, that children have in South African law. Uh, more uh, interesting is what kind of autonomy rights they have, for example, in sexual decision making. Watch out for that conversation. It's going to knock your socks off. We'll keep that for the next time, though. Um, so for me, the main issue that we talk about in terms of child participation rights is that we want to create a culture of mutual respect in our society, no matter what your age. And, you know, it's very important for children to be affirmed in terms of their belonging. They belong to a family, they belong to a group, they belong to a community. This sense of belonging really builds their resilience and is very important for them to feel a sense of self-worth. It's a big protective factor for them from the threats that they face to their safety. It also puts on the table this big issue around equality and the balance of power. Because if we're not powerful over children, who are we powerful over then? I don't think that this issue around being powerful over has any positive effects at all in our society. And we must really start interrogating why we need to feel powerful over somebody else or even something else. Uh, we may take out our frustrations on the dog when we don't believe there's anybody else that we can be hurting because we're hurting. So we need to really um, go into ourselves and think about this issue of power and the power balance in society. And it is very evident, everybody says this around violence prevention, it's the power that's being abused. Um, so we need to also think about how we abuse our power towards children in a society that puts a hierarchy in terms of age. Uh, 
why can we not just have a culture of mutual respect where everybody is provided with dignity and a sense of self and a value right from birth just because they are people. So we need to be able to shift our minds around this big issue of power. Um, what I really want to be able to say uh, about power also and, and violence prevention is participation and especially children's participation rights is a violence prevention strategy. I'm going to say it louder for those at the back. Child participation rights is a violence prevention strategy. Many times people tell us, but we don't have an alternative. We don't know what to do about discipline. We don't know what to do to control our children. Um, I think that control and power abuse is the wrong orientation. It's about creating that sense of belonging, creating that sense of equality, creating that sense of mutual respect. So my first message to you around this topic is really about giving voice to children, affirming that they have opinions and views, listening to those voices, listen to the opinions and views of children on anything and everything that they would like to express themselves on. And then the final one, which we don't get right at all, believe children. When a child tells you, my uncle is touching me inappropriately, believe them. Then we want to go on to the next issue around children's participation in governance. And what does this mean? What does governance and why children and governance? So for me, simply governance, governance means the relationship between people and the government, simply put. In order to build a society that we all can be proud of. And so government has their role and they get some money from taxes from all of us to perform their role. But that's not where our uh, active citizenry should end. We shouldn't just hand over taxes and hand over our vote. We should be engaging government all the time. And especially we should be creating spaces for children to engage government. Now, you're going to say, how can children engage government for heaven's sake? These are very complex issues and matters. What do children understand about the complexities of society? Um, but the, the real issue is that children accede to political and civil rights, the same as everyone else does at birth. They have those rights at birth. The only thing that children don't have the right to do in that space is to vote. But we will also work on that voting age. So let's keep that conversation also at, for a later time. So what does um, engagement with children actually mean? Um, it just means to be authentic, to really accept children for who they are and for what they have to bring. And they really have a lot to offer us if we are authentic. Some of us have tried to include children in governance processes, but instead we make them tokens. We create spaces that are actually adult spaces. We want them to make speeches. We want them to engage in board meetings. We want them to be dressed neatly. We want them to act like adults. We want children to be miniature adults to be able to engage in governance. Children should be children. And Adults must really begin to evolve themselves to reconnect with children and childhoods. I, I always call it childhood amnesia. At 18, you're so in a hurry to grow up and become an adult, you conveniently forget your childhood and conveniently forget uh, how to connect with children. Uh, it, it's not a, a thing that all of us do very easily in, anymore as adults. And so it does require a certain attitude. It requires an attitude of openness and open-mindedness and authenticity and equality. Uh, it requires an attitude. Uh, it also requires an aptitude. 
So there are certain skills that you can learn to be able to value children and their conversations and their way of sharing their life with you. Uh, you, you can learn those skills very easily from those of us who have been in the profession of, of child participation for a long time. But you can also practice children's participation in governance in your own spaces. For example, children should be involved in family meetings. They should be involved in decisions around which schools they would like to attend and why. Which schools you would like them to attend and why those are beneficial for them. So this open communication within families is, is really important for children. It gives them that sense of, of being grounded, of belonging, of affirmation. Then they go to schools and we have their very powerful structure of governance that children can belong to. They can belong to their representative council of learners. And um, many of our children do actually aspire to this kind of children's leadership roles in their schools and they play very important um, and value, valuable positions in their representative council of learners. The representative council of learners is also supposed to be part of the school governing body. Again, not as tokens, not as rubber stamps, but as a bridge for adults to understand the views and experiences and mindsets of children and to keep that uppermost in their decision making on behalf of children. I would like us to move to a point where we have decision making with children. So they can also transition into their community spaces and become leaders in their community spaces, in churches, in uh, civic organizations, in political organizations. They, they do have those aspirations and they uh, want to learn, they want to build themselves into certain types of, of leaders. But it's not only children who are leaders or have leadership potential that should be participating. It's the very shy child as well. It's the very withdrawn child. And those take particular skills of one and one, one on one kind of encouragement and support and, and just um, enabling this child to bring out their voice in the first place. Uh, one very important message that I learned uh, from children in one of my child participation processes is don't only engage with happy children. You're not going to learn a lot about South African childhoods if you keep talking to the children who are good, who are the good models. Uh, no, you have to go and talk to children who are in conflict with the law, children who are discriminated against because they uh, live with disabilities, children who are discriminated against because of their sexual orientation. All these children need to be included in our society to build a better society. And I've come across some lovely novel ways of, of children um, being social change agents as well. Uh, for example, RX Radio at the Red Cross Children's Hospital is the only ra uh, radio station in Africa who is run by children. They have child reporters. I remember being interviewed by Yushra the Toy when she was nine years old and I was blown away because she had her questions, she could follow up, she was interested in what I was telling her and it was all framed from the perspective of a child. I'm very appreciative of that engagement with her because it also teaches me something about child participation. I've worked in programs with children where their music and their art create social change. And here is a magic tool that everyone in their life can use to facilitate and promote child participation. I'm going to teach you like one of my complete magic tricks now, never heard of before. Play with children. Just playing with children, the games that they want to play, when they want to play them, how they want to play them, will help us connect to any level of child. 
And while you're playing, you're having a conversation, you're getting to know the child, and you're getting to understand what that child wants to communicate with you. Play with children. So we need to really mature our democracy to be able to give voice to children, to listen to children, and for children to be heard. We as adults need to do the listening, and especially adults in government have a special role to start listening to children. I want to encourage all that are online right now to perhaps share with us some messages around how they particularly experience life during the COVID pandemic. Top of mind for the children that I engage with right now is their schooling. And I'm going to read to you um, just three quotes that children have sent to me uh, on the weekend to ask me to, to share this with you. Vimbai Watambwa, she's from Ocean View. She said, schooling in Corona is kind of scary for me because we get those students who don't want to follow the rules and precautions, but I think it's better to prevent than cure. And here's the sad part. But who am I to tell government that? Why can't she tell government that? Why is government not listening to her, wanting to share her views about her experience of schooling? Then there's also Sadiq Daniels. He says, my experience is I miss the interaction of lessons and teachers and peers at school. Although we get classes via Zoom, it's definitely not the same as being present. I do consider my health first, so I do not have a problem doing my schoolwork at home, as I do get support from my siblings and my parents. Amahle says I must share with you, one of my major struggles during the lockdown and the process of online learning was a data problem. We were taught via WhatsApp and there was only so much a teacher could do on that platform. They could only assist by sending homework and answers. It was super complicated to work and explain the work by myself. The minister addressed some radio stations, but it's impossible to learn physics or maths from there. Some programs on TV didn't work according to our syllabus. Some were way behind and I needed YouTube because I needed to visualize the explanations. Also, privacy in terms of learning in a small house was a huge challenge. If I couldn't understand the work, I had no one to explain it to me. In between, I was very anxious because I didn't feel ready to write the finals. I think our pass rate will be poor this year. She also said that parents didn't understand when we told them that we can't do certain things because we are busy with schoolwork. There was a lot of distractions. Please do send in your comments of your experiences. Um, I particularly want to say good afternoon, Ambrose Phillips, he's from Balha, and he forms part of a group that I work with, whom I've recruited from the time I've started my office um, on 1st June as Western Cape Commissioner. This is a group of child government monitors. So I'm going to almost model within my office what methods of child participation could be. For me, it's easy. I always just default to children must be involved in everything. So children must be involved in how my physical office looks and feels. Children will be involved in developing the brand for the Western Cape Children's Commissioner. I've written to all the art schools in the province to ask them to nominate an art learner to be part of a reference group that will advise on the branding of the Children's Commissioner's office. Children must simply be part of all the activities that I do. So that default is then very easy for me. They will be trained as government monitors to be able to understand children's rights, the structures and functions of government, the, the national fiscus, the division of revenue, the equitable share formula, all these big words that are about how resources are used in governance. And most important for me, 
They will re reflect on their lived realities. They will share with me the experiences of services. And together, we will advise and recommend to the government departments whom I work with. In Western Cape, the Department of Education, the Department of Social Development, Department of Health, Dep Department of Cultural Affairs and Sport. And so, you know, my main point really is that we must assume capability. That must be our first assumption when we deal with children's participation rights. If you deal from that base, then there's no way you can go wrong with um, including children. But there are pitfalls along the way, as I've said, there are pitfalls around using to children as tokens, about undermining them, about treating them as less than equal. So I think also I want to share with you, just in closing, some of the take home messages that we've covered over this time. We've spoken about when and in which ways children should participate. And we've spoken especially about children in the governance arena. And I've given you my commitment that I will demonstrate, I will lead by example in terms of the ways in which children can be involved in governance. We will soon see children in all kinds of governance spaces. We will be able to then recognize their active citizenship. It is not that they are not active citizens or that they don't want to participate in society productively. We just don't give them the space to do that. And so I, I want to leave you with three key messages. So these are my take home messages for you this afternoon. We have to develop a culture of mutual respect. These are the fundamental building blocks of a human rights culture. When we have mutual respect, no matter who you are, no matter where you live, no matter where you come from, and definitely no matter how old you are, we will go a long way to building a human rights culture. So mutual respect is my first message. The second message is assume capability. When you're dealing with children, assume capability. Yushra Ditoy is also now part of my child monitors group and she's 12 years old. She's the youngest in the group. But her understanding of children's rights and, government, and governance due to her exposure that she has as an RX radio reporter astounds me. I can go through matters with Yushra very, very quickly and, and she's on top of things. Um, and so I, I like this kind of approach where we assume capability and we also don't assume children just want to learn superficial things they want to be analytical they want to be critical they want to be provocative they want to challenge us we must be open to that my final message that i share with you is that little voices must count it's no good we create the culture of giving voice to children um, and then they have no way for their voice to be heard. They are not listened to. Adults still don't take them seriously. And they feel undervalued, unvalued, unloved, unworthy. So the test for us is that little voices must count, must count in all decisions, in families, in schools, in communities, in society. I leave you with those messages and am happy to say that on 1st July, my communication channel via emails will be open on childrens.commissioner at wccc.gov.za. I hope to be able to speak to all of you then, and especially to the children. Thank you.